wonderful musicians um, and voices to sing God's praise, to remind us that we desire God's glory above all else. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word delivered in song, delivered in prayer, uh, delivered straight from your scriptures. We pray, Lord, that you would meet us um, in the midst of a distracting life and world and remind us that you hold everything together, that you know us, that you love us, that you have the future in your hands. And though the whole world gives way, we need not be afraid, for our King holds our lives in his hands. Help us to trust you today, and help us to learn from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we've been going through a series through the book of Galatians, um, and if you've been following this over the course of time, you'll, you'll, you, you will have noticed um, that the book tends to repeat itself a little bit. Um, But it's a theme that's repeated over and over again that we need to hear. And this passage is no different, though I hope that you'll find something new and helpful um, in the midst of it. I'll begin reading in Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who are never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac are children of promise. This is God's word. You know, we'll get into it, but this is a hard passage. It's one of the more confusing passages in the entire New Testament. Uh, But I do believe that the message we receive from it is one that can minister to our hearts and our lives as we understand it. You know, I am grateful to have this opportunity to share God's word with you and to share this morning uh, reflecting on it as Pastor Herb winds down his week of vacation. I've said this before, but I love the Old Testament. I simply love the Old Testament. Um, There are some times that there are passages and parts of it that can be very difficult to get through, um, but there are such wonderful stories uh, when we learn to read it and see it with eyes that see the gospel of Jesus Christ woven into every page. It gives such wisdom for life and hope for the future. One story I found particularly helpful is the story of King Ahaz in the book of Isaiah. King Ahaz in the book of Isaiah around chapter 7 and 6. When Ahaz Ahaz became king of Judah, all of a sudden, this story kind of reads like a a movie script. Um, He became king of Judah and he was immediately confronted with a dire situation. The northern kingdom of Israel had made an alliance with another nation, uh, Damascus, in a conspiracy to invade and plunder Judah under its new king. And so the question was, how would Ahaz respond? It's a test of leadership. When Ahaz got the news, the prophet Isaiah described his fear beautifully, saying the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken, as the trees of a forest are shaken by the wind. If you've ever camped in the woods during a storm, you can picture that. You can even feel that little bit of anxiety with all the creaking. You're wondering if those trees are going to come crashing in on you. But God told Isaiah the prophet to go meet Ahaz. Actually, to meet him out in public. And tell him a startling truth. 
that God himself would take care of the threat, and he didn't need to be afraid at all. He didn't need to be afraid. God promised Ahaz salvation and safety, but he couldn't accept God's promise over the fearful threat that confronted him. So instead of trusting in the power and performance of God, he trusted in the power and performance of another nation, Assyria, and sought out help from them. But instead of help, Assyria came and plundered Judah and laid siege to Jerusalem. And though God ultimately saved his people, the cost of Ahaz's decision to trust himself, his own wisdom and the might of Syria, to bring about his safety rather than trusting God, the cost of that decision was dire. In our passage today, Paul is talking to people who are struggling with a similar problem. They don't have the nation of Assyria beating down their doorsteps and aren't tempted to, to go and, and seek help from another country. No, the Galatians' difficulty with, was how to be certain of God's forgiveness. How to be certain of God's acceptance. Do they trust fully in a God who promises to give them welcome and salvation freely? Or do they trust in their own obedience, their performance, their ingenuity, their ability? Just like Ahaz's advisors who pushed him towards trusting in the strength of the Assyrian army, the Galatians had advisors who counseled them to trust in their own obedience, to make them worthy of God's acceptance. Today we find that Paul takes another Old Testament story, the story of God's promise to Abraham that he would have a son. It's, it's a story, a promise that we looked at back in September and Paul uses this story to show them just how crazy trusting in their own performance is. Now, we've talked about this subject for many weeks. And last week, we looked at it as, from the perspective of, of this conflict as a struggle between works-based religion on the one hand and grace-based religion on the other. This week, we're going to shift points of view. It's like looking at a prism just from another side. Same situation, different perspective. And it's a perspective that has immense practical value for us. Do we trust in our own performance or in the performance of Christ Jesus? What I want you to take away from this message today is that we must live by God's covenant promise in Christ in order to experience freedom from the slavery of trusting in our own performance. We must live by God's covenant promise in Christ to experience freedom from slavery to our own performance. But in order to understand this, this passage, we need some background. In the book of Genesis, beginning in chapter 12, we are given the account of God making a promise to Abraham. Uh, we talked about that again back in September. The promise was that God would bless the world through Abraham's descendants. And ultimately, that pointed forward to Jesus Christ, the descendant of Abraham through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. But there was a problem. There was a big problem. Abraham was pushing 80 or, or more um, when he got this promise. Sarah, his wife, same age. Um, they hadn't had a child. So how in the world were they going to have descendants? Um, so they have this promise of a descendant to bless, that, that would bless the wor world, but then they have the problem that they don't have one. So, um, in the midst of this, Sarah says to Abraham, well, have a child with my servant Hagar, and that will be our son. Now, this is weird to our ears. It's really uncomfortable, and that's okay to feel uncomfortable about this. But remember, this is the ancient Near East. This is a long, long time ago, and though this was sinful... It wasn't necessarily uncommon. But moving on, he, he does this, and the son is named Ishmael. But God says to him, no, that's not how we're going to do things here. I am going to give Sarah a son, even though she's now 100, so you know that I will deliver on my promises. And then Isaac was born. Sarah gave birth to Isaac. It's a wonderful story of God's provision for them. But it doesn't end there. And it doesn't end in a comfortable way. Because Sarah gets jealous of Hagar and Ishmael. And there's a brewing conflict. You can imagine the tension. Um, so Hagar and Ishmael are sent away into the wilderness. Talk about a messy family situation. 
Hopefully none of you have had to go through that. Um, now in Genesis, if we were to look back at Genesis, the story of Hagar and Ishmael is actually a really positive story. It's a story of God's provision for the unseen because God meets Hagar in the wilderness in the midst of her grief and despair and he promises to bless her and bless Ishmael. After this encounter, Hagar calls God the one who sees me. And it's a beautiful picture for those who struggle with being outsiders, who struggle with feeling unseen and neglected. But Paul doesn't use the story in that way. He doesn't look at it from that vantage point. He takes the story of Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and he uses it as an allegory to illustrate the difference between having a covenant relationship with God that's based on obedience and a covenant relationship with God that's based on his promise to save. Now, if you don't know what an allegory is, it's a story told in which the characters take the place of ideas. If you've read The, the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, that story is an allegory. Jim Beachley, uh, one of our elders, recently did a a Sunday school class going through that book. The character, main character is Christian, and he represents the Christian life, and he goes on this journey that takes him through all of these relationships with different people that represent different obstacles we face in our journey as Christians, but they take the form of real people or beasts that he has to fight. Similarly, Paul employs Hagar as a living image of how relying on our own performance enslaves us. How relying on our own performance enslaves us. In verse 22, Paul writes that Abraham had two sons, uh, one by the slave woman, Hagar, and one by the free woman, his wife, Sarah. He says that the son born to Hagar, Ishmael, was born according to the flesh. What does that mean? It means that Abraham was trusting in himself to bring about God's promise. He was trusting in his own ability to bring about God's promise, whereas his son by Sarah was born as the result of God's promise. And there was nothing Abraham could have done to bring that about. It was not achieved by simply human means. He goes on to say in verses 24 through 26, the really confusing part of our passage, that Hagar represents God's covenant with Moses at Mount Sinai, which enslaves... And Sarah represents God's covenant in Christ, which brings freedom. All right, full stop, <laughs> roll back the tape. What in the world does that all mean? To be honest, and I, I mentioned this already, it, this is one of the most confusing passages in the New Testament. But with the context I've given you, the meaning is actually pretty straightforward. The people who had come to lead the Galatians astray were highly religious people. Some of you may have known people like this in your own lives, in your families or, or friends. They were Jews who had accepted Christ, but who also lived under the law. They believed that obedience was the standard for their acceptance. And so they didn't trust Christ fully. They believed that they were the children of Abraham, the descendants of Isaac, and that was kind of a badge of honor. They were the children of promise, and to be children of promise, people had to become like them under the law. But Paul takes that story and he turns it on its head, and he tells them the most offensive thing he possibly could, that no, you're not the children of Sarah, you're the children of Hagar. Because you're seeking relationship with God based on human effort, just like Abraham sought to bring about God's promise through his performance. You see that? You see that he's turning the tables on people who thought they were the children of promise, yet lived under the law. They sought relationship with God based on their own performance, not God's promise. You see, when Abraham had a child with Hagar, what he was doing was relying on his own ability to try and accomplish what God promised. He was seeking to be his own savior. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, God helps those who help themselves. That ain't in the Bible. That's a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> it's not true. 
And this passage tells you that it's not true. Because that's what the people were lying to the Galatians, who were lying to the Galatians were saying. God helps those who help themselves. We do not rely on our own ability to secure what God has promised. We do not seek to be our own saviors. The people who were leading the Galatians astray were trying to be their own saviors as well. Live as though God had never promised to save his people and instead expected them to obey him in order to be accepted. That's what this reference to covenant is all about. They were trying to live as though God's covenant with Moses, where he gives the law, was a saving covenant. When really it was meant to point to their inadequacy and their need of Christ. They treated as th this, this thing that points to Christ as a thing that could save them. When it was really Abraham's covenant, which pointed to Christ, that was meant to save. They needed both. It took a good thing and misused it and in the process became slaves to it and to their own performance. They were just like King Ahaz who trusted in what he could see and understand. The strength of the Assyrians rather than trusting God's promise of deliverance that he gave through Isaiah's words. And because of that, King Ahaz and his people were made to feel what it's like to have to rely on your own performance your own ability, as he failed utterly. The land was plundered, his people were tormented, they experienced lack, and they were plundered by the very same army they put their trust in. Trusting in our works, our works do the same thing to us. Having a hope that's linked to your performance makes you a slave because you can never earn what God gives freely, and you can never perform perfectly. You know, I have a friend I was speaking with recently, a good friend. We were catching up on our respective jobs. I talked about you guys and, and being here at Covenant of Grace. It was a good conversation. <laughs> but he talked about his work, um, and he told me it's been the hardest year of his career. Perhaps some of you can relate to that. Uh, COVID really didn't impact him too greatly. But he's someone who's always been used to success, always been liked, always been able to resolve every problem that came his way. But he made mistakes this year that had consequences, and he wasn't able to fix them all. Can some of you relate to that in your own lives? You can sort of feel that burning anxiety that comes from not being able to fix your own mistakes. And so I asked him how he emotionally dealt with that, and he told me, in honesty, it had kept him up at night. It had given him a lot of anxiety and stress because he's a fixer. <laughs> he wants to be able to put things right. He was doing okay now, but when confronted by the reality of his own inadequate performance, it was like the ground suddenly started shaking for him, like the trees were shaking all around him. Where was his footing when his performance didn't measure up? Who was he? Anyone who's experienced failure can probably relate to that feeling. I know I can. Now, most of us probably don't wake up saying, you know, I'm going to go out and earn my salvation through good works today. Anyone say that? No. But we do hitch our value and our identity to our performance, just like my friend. To borrow the words of Jeremy Pierre, we try uh, to... Excuse me. We try to ground our personal significance and meaning in our performance. We need our grades. And we feel great when we think we deserve an A. You know, you might do it with your parenting. You might do it with your profession, your marriage. An identity linked to our performance enslaves always because we fail inevitably. We're humans. We're fallen. We can't go back and fix what Adam did, despite our best efforts. And it's when we fail that we realize where our trust truly lies. Is it in the Lord who promises to accept us, promises us a future that is unshakable? Or is it in our ability to perform, to deserve acceptance, 
It's like what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Is that you today? Or do you trust in the chariots and horses of your own performance? But that leaves us with a question. What is God's promise to us? And what does it look like for us to move from trusting in our own performance to trusting in Christ? Back in Galatians 3.27, a passage Pastor Herb preached from, Paul made a profound statement about the basis for our acceptance by God when he wrote, In Christ Jesus... You are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You are clothed with Christ. What this verse speaks to is the reality that through faith, we not only receive the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection as he pays the price for our sin, but we also receive, imputed to us, Christ's perfect life. His righteousness, the good works he did, the perfection he is, is laid on us and it clothes us. This is what some call Christ's active obedience is given to us. It is through relying on God's promise of Christ's performance that we are freed. What God promises us is not merely that he would save us by sending Jesus to pay for our sin, but also that we would receive the benefit of his performance, his perfect life. Our sin is laid on him and his perfection is given to us, the great exchange. You see, we don't move from trusting in our own performance to no longer trusting in performance at all. We move from trusting in our own inadequate performance to trusting in the perfect performance of Christ the one who lived perfectly for us. You know, I had asked uh, Brad Cornwell uh, to send me a paper he wrote for a class. Um, He wrote on this passage, having to interpret it. That must have been an adventure. (laughs) Um, But he put it very well when he said that Christ's imputed righteousness is sufficient for our justification. Nothing else needs to be done. I couldn't have put it better. That's what our confession from the Heidelberg Catechism said. Even though my conscience accuses me of sin, nevertheless, out of sheer grace, God grants to me perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ as if I had never been a sinner. If only I accept this gift with a believing in heart. Just like God promised to deliver Uh, to promise to Abraham that he would overcome human inability to deliver on his promise of a son, so God overcomes our inability by providing Christ's performance in our place. This is what it means to be children of promise in verse 28 of our passage. Like Isaac, we are children of promise. Children who receive the benefits of salvation in Christ Jesus, not through human effort or performance, but entirely through the effort and performance of him. Now, how does this practically help us? How does this help us? When we rely on God's promise to us in Christ, it's then that we can experience the joy of our freedom, even in times of failure and disappointment, which some of us are facing right now. In verse 27 of our passage today, Paul takes this wonderful poem from Isaiah 54 and he applies it to us as people who trust in Christ Jesus. It reads, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. This seems like a backwards statement, especially in that culture where even more than now, a woman's value, inappropriately, um, in the eyes of our culture, and even in that culture, can be wrapped up Um, with the ability to have children. There, that was it. That was the center. But he's saying, be glad and rejoice in the midst of it, for you're going to have more children than the one who isn't in that situation. 
Now, this is an analogy. It's an analogy, and, and in context, he's using this to talk about God's promise to restore his people who had been taken into captivity in Babylon. They were barren. They were in suffering. They saw no hope. They didn't have their temple. They didn't have their homeland. They were on their own. But Isaiah gives God's promise to them that they will bear fruit, that they will be restored. They thought they'd never be free and whole, but God promises that they would. Tim Keller interprets the meaning of Isaiah 54.1 in this context well when he says, now that you are helpless, you will see that it is the weak in in whose lives my grace works. Now that you're helpless, you will see that it is the weak in whose lives my grace works. The strong are too busy relying on themselves. I will make you numerous and great. This is why this passage is such good news for us. For it's a reminder that when we fail, that when all hope seems lost, when our performance comes up short, God is not hindered in keeping his promises in any way, shape, or form. Brothers and sisters, if the good news of Jesus Christ is true, then it doesn't matter how much you've failed, how barren your life and its fruit seem to be, trusting in the perfection of Christ with which God clothes every person who trusts him by faith, your life can and will be fruitful. It can and will. Failure exposes the utter bankruptcy of our self-reliance and performance-driven identities that our culture encourages us to have and exposes them for the inadequate shams that they are. The grace of God is not for people who think God helps those who help themselves, trusting in their own performance. It is for those who recognize they are helpless. And in their helplessness, God works apart from their performance to bring hope and a future when all that they see is despair. So in closing, the question I want to leave you with is where do you struggle with trusting in your own performance? I mentioned parenting. You know, I was the most confident in my parenting right up until the day I had a child. (laughs) Perhaps you can relate. I was so certain I knew how everybody else should parent their kids. I love being a dad. It is such a joy, and I've been a dad for 12 years as of today. Happy birthday, Marion. Um, But you know, it has also revealed my inadequate performance. (laughs) It has revealed that I need help. And that I can't put my identity even there because I'd see my failures. I'd see my short temper and my shortcomings. I need the righteousness of Christ to clothe me. Is it struggling in the grip of what you perceive as a failure as a child wanders from the faith? Or do you struggle with overconfidence because everything's going well and in your heart you believe it's all because of you and not the grace of God? In your careers, who will you be if and when you fail? If and when your weakness and inability to perform rears its ugly head? In work, in life, in faith, we have the same struggles. Trusting in what we can see, what we can do, rather than what Christ has done. Will performance enslave you? Or will the knowledge that Christ's perfect performance clothes you by faith bring you hope, and comfort, knowing that your value is not in what you do, but in what Christ has done for you on the cross. Dear brothers and sisters, look to Christ. Look to Christ, knowing that his promises never fail. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you and praise you that you clothe your children with Christ. For our righteousness is but filthy rags. Lord, let us see the cross and the empty tomb. Your perfect son, slain for us, risen for our lives, perfectly obedient to give us 
the benefits of his righteousness. Let us rest in the finished work of Christ, in your active obedience, so that when we fail, we know that you are for us and you accept us. And we have value and purpose and you promise to bring fruit from our lives. Do it, Lord, for your glory, that your name might be praised and that the people who encounter us might know that you are great even when we are weak. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hear this benediction from God's word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters.